Welcome to the program, everyone. This is 10 questions here on WESN. I'm Andy Johnson. Good to see you. Let's tell you what's happening in this edition of the program. He is listed as an international law advocate who is committed to tackling one of the world's biggest problems in the world's highest court. He completed his PhD thesis at the University of Auckland Law School on the strength of an article he had read in a newspaper about how a river came to be regarded as being human, having the same rights as us human beings. He said the following, quote, it was fascinating to read about this legislation that sought to protect the river and aligned it with the Maori worldview that the river is a sacred entity, unquote. He said it got him interested in the country, Takanga, and the legal system there. The title of his thesis is as follows, Earth Trusteeship, a framework for a more effective approach to international environmental law and governance. It begins with a quote from an activist which says that the following, the moment you begin to be attached to the water, the ocean, you become guardians. Guardianship is said to be a major element of earth trusteeship, an idea that posits that the earth and its resources could be held in trust by states for current and future generations. His thesis was based on exploring whether such trusteeship could provide a framework for a more effective approach to international environmental law and governance, thereby addressing head on the ecological crisis. To be a trustee, he says, you give up some authority because you're acting on behalf of someone else. And that's a challenge, he says, in a world where many states prioritize their own interests. His name is Justin Sobian, the son of the illustrious Keith Stanford Sobian, who was Attorney General in Trinidad and Tobago in a government in the last couple of decades. And after that, he was principal of the Human Manly Law School at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. Justin Sobian is talking with us from, well, I was going to say his bed, but he's up and, and, and alive at this point. In Auckland, it is 2 a.m. on Saturday. Justin, well, let me start by thanking you very much for agreeing to do this at such distance and well, what might be some discomfort for you from, from getting you out of your bed, or your bed at the, the dead of night to be there with us. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here, as usual. It's All right, so with you. Yeah, so I, I want to I wanna start by reading something that you said in that newspaper article after you did this work. In my doctoral studies, I was looking at uh, the duties of states, particularly around the holding the earth in trust for future generations. So it was a good fit for me to look about it and talk about this case. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the, the duty to hold the earth in trust uh, for future generations. Now, I think um, that's a very profound statement. Uh, the thing is, the first question is, who is future generation, or who are the future generations? Um, is my one-year-old son or a, a six-month-old daughter uh, a future generation? Uh, in law, that is um, technically a future generation is someone who is not yet born. So that. So even if you, you know, we talk, we tend to think about our children or grandchildren, a future generation. Um, uh, but when we look at it from the legal aspect, a future generation is uh, someone who is not yet born. So the, the question is, does a state have a duty to an abstract group of people who are not yet born? Environmentalists would, of course, argue yes. Um, because we must always provide or, or put things in place for the upcoming generation who are not yet born. Uh, but there's some argument there that uh, states are not, um, should not be responsible for an abstract group of persons who are not yet um, alive and in, 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 uh, within their um, power or jurisdiction. So my thesis, what it really looked at is um, whether states have a duty or an obligation to hold the environment in trust. Now, when we say trust, we use it in the simplistic sense of the word, um, is that you are, you are a caretaker, a guardian, a custodian of the earth or the environment, the only planet which we know that there is human life um, in trust for a generation that is not yet born, um, holding that um, for their benefit. So that is, in a nutshell, what my uh, thesis was looking at. Yeah, and, and I see in the reading that uh, the thesis was, is recognized on the dean's list at the university where you are. Uh, and and the, the, the principal says that, the dean says that um, it, 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 that came about because of what he called the exceptional quality of, of the 
of the thesis that you developed. That, 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 says, that says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, well, it does in a sense. Um, but it was um, a, a rigorous panel, I must say, um, because how these theses, uh, well, how these theses um, uh, recognize uh, that um, you have an uh, independent panel from outside the university. Um, so I had one, um, one uh, scholar that was based in, um, a professor based in Oxford, and another one based in uh, Adelaide University in Australia. Um, so yeah, so it was, but even though um, my internal supervisors, the local supervisors, they were not, um, they were just there to guide through the process. Um, yeah, but we were happy with the result that was, and it was achieved. And I hope that this literature um, could be used um, practical in practical terms um, with respect to the International Court of Justice matter that we are actually um, about to embark, embark upon. Yeah, so t t talk, talk with us a little bit about how you develop the point, uh, as you say here, that uh, you're looking at the duties of states, particularly around holding the earth in trust for future generations. Uh, how, do you, how do you put that against those who say, well, they take the position that, well, the river or the, or, or the earth, the environment around us, they, they don't have, well, this is my, my interpretation, they don't have hearts and, uh, you know, and what have you to beat, and they don't have brains. So how do you, how do you want to put them on the same level as, as human beings? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, the latter aspect you're speaking about, um, the river, <laughs> for example. New Zealand in 2017, as I said, this is what um, generally um, uh, uh, piqued my interest with New Zealand when I read this article in the, uh, back in 2017. Um, New Zealand has uh, the first country in the world to pass legislation that says um, uh, the Fanginui River, which is um, a, a local name for, um, by the indigenous Maori. Uh, the Fanginui River has, um, it's on North Island where I am now, um, has uh, legal rights um, under the uh, Fanginui River Settlement Claims Act as if it was a, a legal person. Just as how you have companies, um, generally in company law, uh, legal persons, you can sue or be sued in the name of a company. A company acts as a legal person, and that is um, recognized throughout um, all domestic laws. Um, so I, I, I was studying that proposal. Um, why did a country like New Zealand give rights to the river. No, the, the, it's, it's, it's a specific, um, it's, it's a kind of unique position because this was advocated by the indigenous Maori, who were the first people of New Zealand. Now, we, of course, have first people in Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribs, Arawaks, you name it. Um, um, but this river is particularly, and other spots in New Zealand, because there's a current trend to try to make other natural spaces illegal persons. But this r river has particular significance to the ancestors and the history. They actually view the river as um, an ancestor or the water is the life that gives uh, power to all human beings and life and so on. Um, so during the many centuries ago, this actually has been going on for centuries, actually. Um, if you look in the history of New Zealand with the Treaty of Waitangi and all these things with the relationship with the Maori and the Krong, which I won't really want to get into too much detail with. Um, but it's in interesting there because <clears throat> the Krong, well, New Zealand being still um, um, under the jurisdiction of the King of, of England, um, the Krong, the act says that the Krong, which is the government, appoints one person to be the face of the river, and the second person Will, it, it will be agreed between um, the, Ma the local Maori who actually are the guardians of that river. So what you have is the first time in history where two um, persons, that is the minister, a minister appointed by the Crown and a chief appointed by the local Maori living in that particular district, are seen as the face of the river and the guardian of the river. So everything that has to do with, because it's actually a tourist site, well, when I say so, it's a tourist site, it's also a source of life, it's a home for some Maori. So any, anything that has to do that would um, detract from the environment or to damage um, the flow of the river or the purity of that river would have to go through these, this body which comprises two persons. So it's kind of interesting to see if we in Trinidad and Tobago would be able, because we have a number, as you know, Andy, a number of um, natural spaces, which may be um, 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 
relevant not only to indigenous persons, but also for um, local communities. Um, I, I have said it already in um, several interviews before, even in a TEDx talk, that I would like to see the Karni Swamp, for example, or the Boko Reef in Trinidad and, and in Tobago, um, the Karni Swamp in Trinidad and the Boko Reef in Tobago. Why can't we um, give rights per se and have um, a body or a face that is responsible for the purity or the keeping the conserving or preserving the integrity of the ecosystems. So I think uh, especially the Karani Swamp, which, um, which is the home of our scarlet ibis, as you know, our national bird. So these are things, futuristic ideas, which are already in place, and we can follow this type of model. And, and you think that we, we will come to a day of reckoning if, if we don't move um, um, more sort of um, seriously in that kind of direction, if we're talking about about uh, uh, saving planet Earth and, and you know facing uh, what you will call well, you know global destruction, uh, you know and environmental destruction and, and loss. Do you think we will come to that day when we will rule the, the fact that we, we haven't paid sufficient attention to these things and we refuse to take the the, 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 the decisions to do, do to do to do just that to, to, to protect our environment for even for ourselves the way, you know, the speed at which things are happening, far less for future generations. Yeah, we'll have to. It's, 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 it's a must. Um, it's just a matter of when. Uh, but the common reply I get, because I've been advocating for this for years now, um, uh, but the common argument you get, even not even Trinidad, when I've traveled, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Vincent in the region, is that, well, um, the, government, the government does not respect, or the police or whoever, those who are in authority, does not respect my own human rights. So, so why should we give rights to an inanimate object like a river and a, a mountain or a forest? Um, in New Zealand, there's also a forest that has rights. Uh, um, in India, for example, um, the High Court, it wasn't true legislation, but it, right after the New Zealand decision, and they referred to the New Zealand decision, I think it was in 20, the same 2017, the High Court there said that the Ganges has legal, right, legal rights as a legal person because of its um, distinct connection with um, the Hinduism and need to, um, it's a source of life, uh, water, and so on. Um, but yeah, I think we, we, we must, the model has been set there. Um, yeah. There's a trend that is going on. People have already been speaking about um, the bleaching of the coral reefs. Um, well, I remember days uh, when I was younger. The, to me, I don't know the. Well, we still the water is still blue, right, in um, the Buku Reef, and it's still shallow. But I still remember seeing more fishes in the in, and more coral reefs in the Buku Reef. So these are things where it comes back to humans having. Uh, it's a mindset, really more than an obligation. Well, it is an obligation, but a mindset that let's hold the earth in trust or the environment or certain natural spaces um, in trust for, uh, for the present and future generations. So I think it's, it's something that would have to happen, um, but it's just a matter of when. Yeah, I, I want to mention also that um, you were listed as, a, as, as an international human rights officer with the, with the United Nations. Um, how do you make switch in this case between human rights and, and environmental rights? And, and, and because I think we could say that um, your, your position, you know, uh, um, academically and, and, and so on, equates the two as you, you're trying to, to demonstrate now. That, that there is something that, that makes environmental rights and protection, puts it almost on an, an equal footing with human rights and, and, and rights protection of, of peoples in the world, correct? Yeah, 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 definitely. There is an inextricable link between human rights and um, environmental rights. Um, and ironically, that's how I, I started thinking about doing my PhD thesis was when I was working with the United Nations. Um, that was about six years, seven years ago. Uh, that um, I was sitting in the Human Rights Council because at that time I was working with the president of the Human Rights Council. Um, an ambassador, well, it was the ambassador of Slovenia and then the ambassador of Sen Senegal. And um, then came across the, that's where I got about the New Zealand delegation. They were speaking about um, human rights and the rights of nature. And I, I thought, yeah, that sounds interesting because when we talk about human rights, you know, we have this anthropocentric worldview that human rights is just for humans. I mean, now they have like animal rights, which is something, another topic that, of course, I'm interested in, and um, um, nature rights. 
Now, as I see it, as I always tell uh, my law students at the University of Auckland, that if you really want to do something for the, the international community or international law, there are two things that, uh, um, that are very uh, important in terms of um, your rights as a human being. Uh, or there are two matters which affect humanity, and that is human rights, and the second one is climate change, environmental rights. Right? So forget about intellectual property, land law, um, whatever have you, running down actions, um, corporate law. I mean, these are important, but if you really want to do to have an impact on humanity using the law, um, those are the two critical areas. So for example, um, all constitutions have the right to life. But you can't, and to enjoy that right to life, um, you must have a healthy planet to live in. That, that's the, the most um, fundamental right in any constitution. WHO says that um, the, every year, 7 million persons are, um, are killed by, um, um, by uh, pollution or directly or indirectly. Uh, um, or, so I think that um, that's something that speaks uh, volumes, really. So I think that these are the things that we have to consider. How can we live in a healthy and sustainable planet um, um, for all? So that's why I, it's always good to draw that connection. And I think human rights um, advocates and environmentalists have realized that there's a strong connection between human rights and, um, and, and, and environmental law. Right. And in, in the article that I read, it says that the United Nations top court announced that public hearings for, for this landmark case will begin in December, on December 2nd as such, and that you are coordinating the Caribbean submissions. You're doing that while you're also tutoring. Talk a little bit about, about that, what it means to be coordinating the position of, of, of Caribbean countries on this question. Yeah, so that was... So and you, you represent you, some of us and not all of us, but we could, we could talk about that, <laughs> you know, the Grenada yeah. and, and St. Vincent and so on, but not Trinidad and Tobago, yeah. among others. We could talk yeah. about that afterwards. Yeah, yeah. so, so again, all these things just happened. This kind of happened at the right time. Um, I was sitting here in New Zealand working on a committee in the New Zealand Centre for Environmental Law, and we were called upon to um, advise Pacific students because it started in the Pacific, this region. It started in Vanuatu, actually, a Pacific island state. Yes. And um, we were called to advise some Pacific students. Well, this is a center in the, at the university. Because the Pacific students lobbied Vanuatu. And this is students from the law faculty at the University of South Pacific. Um, because individuals cannot take a matter to the International Court of Justice. It's the um, states must bring an action on behalf of it. So, so individuals do not have legal standing. And um, they came for advice. And um, the long and short of it, Vanuatu took their case to the court. And when we were, so I was part of that, we, well, part of that, those discussions, me and some colleagues here in New Zealand. And they said, well, Justin, you're from the Caribbean. You're the only one here. And the Pacific and the small island states, now this was, Andy, this would have been in 2021. Um, mind you, would probably start the students were talking about this since 2019 just, or 2018, just before COVID. Well, uh, uh, so they said, can you assist us? We are just, and it's the truth, um, I've been to Fiji. Fiji is just like Trinidad and Tobago, um, with the same culture, um, the same African heritage, um, indentured laborers from India living there. Um, you close your eyes, you think you're in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Um, so they have the same kind of ethnic composition, same culture. Uh, so we are just like the Pacific, but the other side of the world. Only thing Pacific is more vulnerable, I would say, because they, in the Pacific Ocean, which is the biggest ocean in the world, we are just the Caribbean Sea. But mind you, we are still small island developing states. So they have asked, so yeah, try to get some Caribbean countries on board. And that's how my role, it just started organically like that. Um, uh, and then all of a sudden, I um, reached out to, I've contacted every single CARICOM state. 
Um, and we're happy to say that um, this is at the beginning. Some states didn't even know about it, of course, because it was more in the Pacific region. In 2023, um, the 2023, March 2023, I believe, the Belize, a uh, CARICOM heads of government met in Belize and they accepted um, that they would, um, they would, they accepted Vanuatu's proposal to go to the International Court of Justice. So we, we were the first regional group in the world, that is CARICOM, to support Vanuatu in this initiative. Before the EU, before the African Union, what have you. We were the, before the Asian, well, Pacific region, they were always in support. So we were the first region in the world. Um, um, but through the advocacy and after getting some colleagues on board, we are happy that um, as today, seven out of the 14, now I wouldn't say 15 because Montserrat still falls under the UK system, but seven out of the 14, so half, half which is pretty good. Um, Haiti, we know, we were trying to lobby Haiti, but Haiti, we know, have their own political, um, unfortunately, their own political internal domestic problems. Um, but I think we are happy with where we are. Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Guyana, Jamaica, uh, the three major players, I would say, were, um, we would like them to be involved in this um, climate change case for future generations at the International Court of Justice. Um, and I, I, I think we'll get there, uh, but of course it's a political decision to be made. All right, so going back to what it says about the thesis, uh, looking at the duties of states, particularly around holding the earth in trust for future generations, uh, what, what can you tell us about what you have concluded about that? What, what is the statement you make about, about that, holding the earth in trust for future generations? All right, so it's just like, as we said, trust is, you have a, a piece of land, to break it down simply, you have a piece of land or piece of property, and you say, well, I'm holding this, um, in trust for my granddaughter um, until she attains the age of 18, this will be her property. So you would want to use this property in such a way um, that it does not deteriorate, it does not spoil if you have fruits or vineyards or, um, or not to sound biblical or anything like that. You know, you want to reap it, you want to make sure it goes over, um, uh, you have reaped the bounties of it if it's um, 20 fold, 50 fold, 100 fold. So when your granddaughter acquires um, a maximum age, she will be able to reap the fruits of this um, um, property that you have left for her, and she would, of course, be very much appreciated. One South African um, academic explained it in a way that um, it, we call that like an attitude of gratitude um, for the younger generation or generations to come. One South African academic explained it like if you're young and you and you hitchhike and um, you don't have a car uh, and you hitchhike and um, one day somebody stops for you, um, you're very much appreciated of that. And as you get older um, and you're able, you now have education, you have a job and able to afford a car, you will more than likely be able to uh, stop many years later for someone else who hitchhikes because you understood the dilemma or the plight that that person went through based on your past experience. So I thought that was a good way of looking at it. Um, so trusteeship really says, is a theory of intergenerational equity, which says that each generation is entitled to inherit a planet at least uh, level as they had got it from their previous generations. Um, so to put it in another word, what we receive today, we will try to keep that at, well, it will be better to increase the value of it, but we will try to keep it at the minimum value when we pass it on to the next Right. Uh, you say because this is important as a f to provide a framework for more effective approach to international environmental law and governance, mm -hmm. thereby addressing head-on the ecological crisis. Wh what, what do you see that looking like, this, the ecological crisis that is probably... Yeah, yeah. yeah so we, we're, in a, we, we're in an ecological crisis. A number of countries have, have called um, a climate change emergency, New Zealand being one, Trinidad and Tobago not yet. I don't think any country in the Caribbean. Uh, but it, yeah, we, the thing is, is that how do we address this ecological crisis? Is environmental law a priority? To, or the ecological crisis is a priority to certain states. Um, 
I would think that, um, as we said, my thesis advocates, it's a good framework, but the criticism to it is that um, I do not think that um, states, it, it's a political thing. States, is it a priority to hold the earth in trust? You know, people might say, what's a priority for your government? My government is to increase, well, to decrease crime, to a cost of living crisis, provide probably more housing. Um, that would be the, the ultimate priority of some states, if you ask. Um, the difficulty is, is that if you are a trustee for somebody, for future generation, that means that you are, in a sense, um, being told what to do. You're being told, you're acting on behalf of somebody else and not the interests of, well, not your interests of the state in itself. Um, so being a trustee means that in some way you give up some sovereignty because you're not acting on behalf of yourself as a state. Uh, but we look at it the next way. We, there's a spin to it, actually, that being a trustee entitles you with more obligations to humanity. Right? It gives, it invests you with obligations to do things for the benefit of humanity. It's sort of altruistic, but you now have actually added burdens, added obligations. So in that sense, you're not really giving up your sovereignty. Um, it's just that you have more work to do on behalf of um, a certain part of present and future generations. Yeah, so more work that's to do how that is. More work to do that is important. We will stay in touch with you because, say that uh, when you when you shall have led the, the the mission to the United Nations, we'll come back and talk about what is meant by being an international uh, human rights officer with the United Nations, and come back on the issue how it has been introduced and, and what the reaction would have been. But thank you very much for talking with us and this and taking the time and going through the the challenge of hooking up with this at this time of, of the day for you yeah. <laughs> in Auckland. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. It's always a pleasure. And um, yeah, it's just good talking to you and getting the message across because I think it's very important. And thank you for being um, right, also an again. advocate in your own ways. Yes. Justin thank you, Subian. Andy. Thank you very much. This thank has you. been 10 Questions. I'm Andy Johnson. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.